Sarah Parker. Welcome to Careers That Matter. And you do have a career that matters because what you do has an impact on how other people can make uh, changes in our society. How do you describe what your job is? I describe it as my dream job. Oh, isn't that and a absolutely. fabulous thing? Yeah. It is. Yeah. I mean, I feel so grateful and privileged to be able to do work that is values aligned, that is meaningful, and where I hope to be that catalyst that you just suggested. And so with that comes a very real weight around the responsibility to get it right. So what is your job title and what does right. it entail? <laughs> so it's not called dream job. <laughs> That's my subtitle. Right. My actual title is Vice President of Grants and Community Initiatives at the Vancouver Foundation. And the shorthand is that I like to joke that I'm responsible for spending the money mm -hmm. of the Vancouver Foundation. Is the dream in the sense that you get to see uh, the benefit of, of uh, supporting somebody else's endeavors with money, but you can see the outcome? Uh, is that is that what makes it a dream job or you know what are those elements that make you go I can hardly wait to get to work in the morning I think it's more about that values alignment and doing meaningful work I don't think there's one right way to do that I think all of us can contribute in multiple sectors mm -hmm. and I've had the great privilege in my career of working in a sector who's dedicated to doing good and then more specifically why this is my dream job is that Roughly, I would characterize myself as, ha as having worked in uh, social change organizations for 20 plus years. And the majority of that time, I was asking people for money. I was one of those nonprofits who was, you know, scrambling to make the project happen, to pay the staff, to, to make those outcomes happen, and often was frustrated by funding systems and their limitations and what seemed to be a, a significant gap of knowledge between those who were doling out the dollars and those who were requesting the dollars. And so, Stepping into the funding side, which I did four years ago, and more recently, nine months ago, joining Vancouver Foundation, was an opportunity to influence that system and to try mm -hmm. and shift power within that system. So how'd you get here? You talk about 20 years mm -hmm. <laughs> in this sector. Where did you start? You're, you're graduating from high school and you're thinking, what am I going to do with my life? Where did you go? And what was your objective? I mean, if that's where we're starting, I went to Whistler and taught snowboarding full time for a season, which was just delightful. And I highly recommend that not for everyone, but for many, I think taking that gap year between high school and any kind of post-secondary just to live a little bit and experience and work and travel are all really good things. They served me very well. Why? What did it do in your thinking that, that helped to focus what you wanted to do next? I think it helped me transition from teenager to adult, not fully formed adult, right. but in enabling experiences. So I moved from Ontario to BC, so from the suburbs of Toronto to Whistler, British Columbia, and therefore lived on my own, uh, had to pay rent, uh, had to uh, build a new network of friends and colleagues, had to navigate my first full-time job. And all of that was just good life training. And also I had the best job. I was living <laughs> on a mountain and teaching skiing and snowboarding to children. I just loved it. So mm -hmm. it was just experiential learning. And I don't think the experiential learning, like what type matters so much. It was just that opportunity to become an adult. Okay. So it is part of that transition into adulthood. At some point you go, Okay, now I want to do something else. What was that? You went back to school? I went to school. And for me, I was never clear I want to be a nonprofit executive. I wasn't even clear that I wanted to work in the nonprofit sector. School came fairly easily to me. So it was clear that I wanted to go to university because that seemed like a good learning opportunity. But in fact, I don't know if I should be saying this on camera, the best parts of my undergraduate experience were not the formal classroom learning, but everything around it. So I played varsity rugby, which was just a real delight. Go Canada. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't play for Canada. I'm just cheering for them. Yeah. Uh, but I did. You know, I played competitive rugby. I volunteered and edited a magazine at um, our at our university. I went abroad for a year and lived in Australia. 
And all of these experiences were incredible. And the classes were okay too. I learned a few things along the way, but really I think it was the experience. Well, and you also learn to develop those complex social skills that become fundamentally important as you grow within a career. Uh, and Agreed. so that's the side benefit of going uh, into post-secondary education, now being fully responsible for yourself. Um, I think so. And yeah. I did, you know, I... <laughs> I joke mm -hmm. a lot about this. My undergraduate was a double major in politics and drama, which at first Aren't glance... are the same thing? So I'm many ask course, that, yeah. many yeah. ask that, or usually there's <laughs> a, you know, an immediate <laughs> confusion and then a, <laughs> ah, yeah. that's a perfect alignment. Yeah. Yeah. And what I appreciate about studying two very different fields is that they played on very different skill sets. So I appreciated the theoretical uh, political frameworks from poli-sci, and, you know, in a bit of a worldview and talking about power and because essentially that's how I understand politics is a mm -hmm. reflection of how power is exercised. Studying drama was an opportunity to be much more embodied in how you understand relationship and mm -hmm. people and story. And honestly, I would attribute any so-called success I've achieved uh in part to that training and, and yeah. being a good storyteller and understanding how humans interact. I'm actually an awful actor, uh, but I am a great storyteller. I hope, ah. <laughs> I hope I'm proving myself right now. Yes, you are. Now, I know that at some point in your career, you wind up in urban planning. What mm. happened? Uh, Poli-sci, drama, urban planning. How, like, how does that triangle complete itself? So in between mm. was a couple years living in China, Lesotho, and then working as a tour guide in Europe. And in fact, it was those experiences, well, more specifically... I spent a year in Lesotho, which uh, for the trivia buffs is a tiny landlocked country in the southeast quadrant of South Africa. So it's a country within a country. I also had to look it up in a map back when I found out I was going to be working there for a year. And now I know a lot about it. So my time there was uh, catalytic in terms of having me think about going back to school, which ultimately I decided on urban planning and moved to Vancouver to do that. At UBC? At UBC. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My story is that, uh, so this is 2003. Mm -hmm. And and so I'm just giving you the state of the internet then. So I'm in this small uh, Southern African country that's on dial-up that works, you know, once a week. And I was chatting on MSN Messenger to a Canadian colleague in Ghana. And he said that he'd just gotten into a planning program. And I said, what is that? I'd never heard of planning. And two years later, I was at UBC. Wow. Mm -hmm. You graduate from there and you enter that, that sector. Uh, or did you go straight to not-for-profit? I did actually go straight to not-for-profit. I was a planner who never anticipated working as a planner in City Hall. Uh -huh. I still identify as a planner, even though most folks would look at my job title and not make that connection. But fundamentally, what we're doing at Vancouver Foundation is building healthy, vibrant, and livable communities. And I think that's what planners are trying to do. And I always came in with the social lens. So... Mm -hmm. I was never going to be an urban designer. I was interested in social policy and all of the topics uh, that fit under that. So thinking about identity and location and, and how do we create inclusive, healthy communities. So straight out of my master's degree, I went to work for the United Nations Association in Canada. Uh, mm. And I spent a couple of years there running a national program. And then I did accidentally become a planner. So I worked at the city of Burnaby for three years as a social planner, which I'm grateful for the experience because I think it gave me a deep appreciation for folks who work in government. Yes. It was not the right fit for me. The, the pace of government uh, didn't align with the urgency I feel around some of the issues <laughs> that I care about. You didn't even have to tell me that and I could tell <laughs> yeah. that that would be the case. I mean, <laughs> and I'm so grateful that there are so many brilliant champions working at all levels of government to make change happen. And it doesn't rule out that I might never return, but what I, so I spent a few years there and then return, well, actually, and then, this is fun, mm -hmm. I... Uh, decided that it wasn't the right fit. And so I quit my job and I sold my condo in East Vancouver and I moved to Spain for a year. 
Wow. Which I officially call my sabbatical year, or yes. as the Spanish say, mi año sabático. Yeah. That was an awful accent, uh, which was delightful. And something I also encourage folks to do is it was just a, a bit of a reset. I, I love traveling. I've always loved traveling. I've lived in a bunch of different places. And so I just took a year to learn Spanish, which was not something I needed to do, but I love languages. I'm awful at them, but I yeah. love them. And eat a lot of tapas. And I think we hit, I don't know, 15 countries or something. Wow. And sweet. I came back really refreshed. Yes. And jumped back into the not for profits. And I did. And so yeah. then I was actually at a turning point. So part of that year was to explore okay, what do I want to do next in my career? Because I knew uh, being a planner in City Hall was not the right fit, but I wasn't sure what was next. I really love storytelling. <laughs> so I actually applied to do a second master's degree at UBC in journalism. Mm -hmm. And and then came back and was hemming and hawing whether I should start that program or not. And I was a little nervous about being overeducated and underemployed. And journalism is a rapidly changing field, as you know. Yeah. Uh, and I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure it was the right choice. But I love storytelling, and I, I recognized that I didn't have any credentials in that area. I ended up taking a short nonprofit contract instead of doing the degree, and that was nine years ago, and I've never looked back. Mm -hmm. And so for the last uh, just under a decade, I've been working in leadership roles in the nonprofit sector, and this is definitely my home. You know, as I hear you talk about the path that you mm. chose, uh, it doesn't sound to me that you ever said, okay, well, uh, I have to stay put because I'm worried that I won't find employment or I won't find fulfillment somewhere else. I have to like hang on to this job because it's so vitally important. It's as though you were moving forward in life with a sense of the possible rather than uh, a fear of the impossible. How'd you get that? Where'd that come from? That's a nice way to be described. I, I hope that's true. I think it's true. And also... What's driven me has evolved over the years. So one of the things that enabled me to take those risks, I was not driven by money at all. So I made choices that weren't grounded in compensation or stability. I have a fairly high risk tolerance, so I was willing to move. I was willing mm -hmm. to forego security that's often peddled as critically important and, and is for some folks. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I didn't have... A, a family to take care of. So I had some more flexibility that way. And ultimately, I think my driver, it's sort of twofold. And I think the concepts are married. At its simplest, I want to do good in the world. I want to, I want to contribute. I want to do something meaningful. And that's been, that's been so clear to me for as long as I can remember Yeah. how to do it. That's a, you know, the billion dollar question, but working towards that has been has informed every choice I've made. And then the second concept is that I also want to be happy. Yeah. And the reason I think those things are intertwined is that I know I feel most fulfilled when I am doing purpose-driven work. Yeah. And and I don't think any of us are effective at helping anyone else if we're not taking care of ourselves. So these concepts uh, bleed together because I know that uh, they're reinforcing that if I'm doing yeah. meaningful purpose-driven work where I feel like I'm trying uh, my best to contribute uh, then I am happier and so they just keep feeding off each other. So who were uh, some of the people who influenced you in your decision making either by oh. example or directly through you, know, you asking them how do I yeah. take on this challenge and how do I address that? And, oh, so or, many. Or, yeah. Yeah. But were, uh, was there one or two that are, that stand out and you go, yeah, you know, this person really made a difference in helping me yeah. understand how important it was to say, I want the signature of my life to be that I made a, that I made a difference and that the world is a better place because I was here. I think of the answer in two different ways. I think of those famous role models that we all look up to in different ways who have, you know, dedicated their lives to being change makers and advancing social, environmental, economic justice issues for all of us. And, you know, those people inspire me greatly. In my, yes. If you come into my office, I have a series of quotes from people who I look up to like, 
Chimamanda Adichie Ngozi, the Nigerian author, I think is just mm-hmm. brilliant and such a powerful change maker. I think of Audre Lorde and uh, how deeply black mm-hmm. queer feminism has influenced my life. And, uh, you know, you're also speaking about like local mentors, like who literally when I'm like struggling in a career decision, mm-hmm. I didn't go talk to Audre Lorde. I wish I could have. Yeah. Um, and when I think about that concept, I, you know, I get asked about mentorship a lot, both uh, being a mentor to others, and I've been mentored many times, but not in that formal way where there's a program and you kind of get matched. Yeah, yeah. And I've often found, like, one of my my key survival slash success strategies is surrounding myself with, like, good, smart people that I really trust. And sometimes I reach out to those people like once or twice in my lifetime. And sometimes I engage with them more regularly right. and it depends on the moment. And mm-hmm. But I, I think it goes back to relationship and that skill around cultivating relationship. And I know that I have not achieved anything outside of relationship in my life. And so what I'm quite good at is um, when I hear someone speak or find someone I admire or know of someone doing something good, I'm, I'm, I pursue them and I make them my friend. Mm. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm, yeah. a, I'm an aggressive friend maker. Well, I think another element to having a successful life is to have a fine mind and you clearly have a fine mind. How did you develop your, uh, well, your worldview, your perspective and mm. the confidence to say, yeah, okay, I can work this out. I can I can think my way through this and mm. find the appropriate answer. I don't know. Yeah. I think I've always had more confidence than I warrant. So <laughs> <laughs> But confidence also plays an important role in how we choose to move forward. It's Do been we a take tool. on opportunities? Um even though they may be stretching us beyond our current understanding uh or a, a skill set. But the confidence that you have in your ability to get there can help move you forward. And I think that there are people who get held back because they don't have that sense. And yet they might have been able to achieve it. A hundred percent. And I think so much of our social identity can inform that. I I often joke that I have the confidence of a mediocre white man and always have. And that, you know, being a woman, we're constantly receiving messages that we shouldn't be this confident. And in fact, when we show up as confident, it's often perceived differently as Uh aggressiveness or uh, unfriendliness, you know, a variety of things. There's an enormous amount of research that substantiates this. So I don't know. I, I, I will share that I had a, and have a very supportive family who, you know, I grew up being told I could do whatever I wanted to do. So and that is important. I believed them, I guess. Yeah. And, and I, I think, you know, interestingly, because I do a lot of work around social justice and so I think about social location a lot and I come from a, like a, a middle class suburban family and who, you know, had a lot of stability and and privilege. And my family uh, was an entrepreneurial family who kind of moved themselves into the middle class from a blue collar status. And I share that because I was the first person in my extended family to go to post-secondary. And I think there was a naivety that actually helped with my confidence. Like I didn't yeah. know what I didn't know yeah. uh, because I honestly just, I didn't grow up in a family of uh, professionals or uh, I did. So I didn't, but you I grew didn't up even in know a, to be intimidated. Yeah. But you grew up in a family of people who said, well, I'm going to go yeah. do that. And uh, despite what the world may have told them beforehand that, well, that's beyond your reach. They went, no, it's not. And went out and demonstrated that you can achieve Uh, what you set your mind to. I had a lot of unconditional love and support and a belief in my ability. And I do think those things are like, they're intangible and they're so critical, right? And so certainly that contributed to my unwarranted confidence (laughs) to get through the world. (laughs) Well, and now you get to bring that full circle and support other people as they endeavor to make the world a better place too, especially our society. That's certainly my hope. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing a portion of your journey with us. My pleasure.